Hi, I'm Aldo. Welcome to Plays the Thing, the channel where I share my experiences prepping and playing tabletop role-playing games. This is the next in my series on the Sentinels of Justice, that superhero game that I'm running using the Champions Now rules. And Champions Now, of course, is the superhero role-playing game written by Ron Edwards and published by Hero Games. I am super excited to be doing this installment because we've been building up to it for quite some time. This is our first session play report. Before we get there, a little bit of a reminder. Our first video in this series talked about how a game master uses the two-statement rule to kick off a Champions Now game by presenting the heroes with uh, two statements that capture the, the core of what the game is about. The second important video that we did for the series talked about how players will take those two statements, read them, interpret them, and then respond to them by brainstorming characters on a three-corner worksheet that they then present to the game master as a gift. Then we talked about how it, how it looks, what it looks like when those three-corner sheets are fully articulated into hero sheets that the players can use in play. And finally, we talked about how the game master will use those hero sheets to draft the now, which is a document and a tool that they will use to stimulate or to foster play in the game. Today, we are going to talk about what happened when I fostered play in the game and my players, you know, uh, did their thing. So before we go there, what I would like to do, and bear with me here as I get organized, is that I would like to show you the tools that I use to run this game. There we go. To run this game online. See, unfortunately, almost all of the gaming that I do these days is online. I much prefer in-person gaming, of course. Um, so, you know, we take advantage of some of the tools that are out there. And here we are on the Foundry VTT game that I've set up to run this campaign. You'll see here our homepage, which, you know, the backdrop here around is here is a, a photograph of the 1935 New York skyline that I ran through a filter, a golden age style filter to produce this. And then what you see here is these kind of oversized character tokens. They're oversized because really I don't have these for play. I just have them here to showcase the, the, the four heroes, right? Spitfire, Justicar, Silver Spectre, and Major Gawker. Um, and then if we click on uh, any one of these tokens, you'll see a character sheet. And that's one of the reasons that I selected Foundry VTT because the tools that it provides enable somebody like me who has almost no coding ability to create working character sheets for any game that I want. They're not pretty, but they're functional and they do the job. So here is the, the character sheet for Spitfire. You, of course, see her code name featured prominently at the top left. You also see her real name and uh, in you know profession uh, just under that. Those will appear regardless of what tab we are on on the character sheet. You'll see the 3D6 right under that in the middle of the sheet. And that is a, uh, a, a, a button that you can use to roll three dice. It, you know, so here, let's do it. I'm going to roll 3D6 once. There you go. And she rolled a 13. So Spitfire rolled a 13. So she could roll that to hit or she can roll that to make um, characteristic rolls or perception rolls or what have you. Okay. In addition, we have these different tabs. So the title tab will tell you the title of the comic. This says Sentinels of Freedom because that's how we started the campaign. We switched it to Sentinels of Justice after the first play session. And then we have the statements here to remind us what we play about and then a space for experience earned and used. We have a situations tab, which just replicates what's on the actual character sheet. Um, you know, the first character, the, the actual character sheet that we have in hand, same with characteristics. They're all listed here, just like they are on the, on the physical character sheet, um, a skills tab, powers tab, right? None of these are rollable. This is just the information. And then finally a combat tab that, um, re-expresses a lot of the information you'll find on the other tabs, but in a way that is more conducive to 
to how you use them in combat. So speeds at the top with phases, dexterity and ego are there. We have spaces to the right where you can record how much, you know, knockout you've taken or how much endurance you've used. You have the, the maneuvers here. So this is just handy for players to use during play. Okay. So in addition to that 3D6 that's on the character sheet, if you go down to the bottom left hand of the screen over here and you see this die here, it says effect roll over it when I hover over it with my mouse. And if I click on that, I'm going to get this window. And here I can just enter the number of dice that I'm rolling. So if Spitfire has a 76 sort of breath weapon attack, which she does, I can enter the seven there and hit roll. And look at that. Roll seven dice. The knockout is 23. The core rolled is six, right? So for those of you who play older versions of champions, that would be the knockout would be the stun and the core would be the body, right? So, you know, I love rolling physical dice and I'm very adept at, you know, organizing those into groups of 10 and counting the remainder and figuring out pretty quickly what I've rolled. But at least one of my players is new to champions and not very comfortable with tabulating so many dice so quickly. And even my players who are familiar with how the game works and do have practice with that sort of thing, they appreciate the convenience of this die roller. I didn't code that die roller. Somebody that I might have met online did that for me. I don't remember their name, um, but um, I will try to give them credit later when I look it up. And, you know, these are the tools that I use. I can probably make these tools available to folks if they're interested. So reach out if that's something that you'd like for me to do, and I'll figure out how to do it. All right, so enough of the tools. Let's talk about what happened during play. The first thing I needed to do is set the scene, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't end up kind of lecturing about the setting. I had a lot of information at my fingertips, and it would have been easy for me to become long-winded about this. So I wanted to set this up as as simply as possible. So I basically started by saying something like this. It's January of 1935 in New York City, and hope has outdared the ravages of the Great Depression. FDR is in the White House, LaGuardia is in City Hall, and although the Depression is still going on, people are starting to get the sense that they can band together to create a world defined by fellowship and generosity instead of discord and greed. But opportunists continue to prey on the suffering and reactionaries threaten to shred the national fabric. Standing united against such villainy are you guys, right? Spitfire, Justicar, Silver Spectre, Major Shocker, the Sentinels of Freedom, right? And again, that Sentinels of Freedom would be retconned to Sentinels of Justice after the events of our first session. So... After having set things up that simply, and they un understand that they understood that they're already a group that had been operating together for some time, and we didn't hash out any of the details of how they got together or what they had been doing or how long they'd been together. They're just a group. I then zeroed in on Silver Spectre because I had already decided to activate the stuff that was on her sheet for play this time around. Right, knowing that in the next session I would be poking at stuff in other people's sheets and that I would be rotating through the characters in that way until I had all these, you know, elements in the air at once and they were responding to all of them and stuff. But we're starting off with her stuff. Now, just because I'm starting off with her stuff, though, it doesn't mean that I was just going to present it all to her. Right. I, I um, was very, they're, they're basically, I knew that the Silver Legion was up to something, but I didn't know if she knew what they were up to. So I asked her to make a detective work role. Now, a couple of things here. First, and I'm curious to hear Ron and others speak about this, but first, I'm kind of of the opinion that, um, that detective work should be something that the player is actively telling the game master that they are using i'm hesitant to have detective work be an element that sits passively on the hero sheet and allows me to use as an excuse to just feed players information right you know to move things along in a direction that i want so i am i i, I debated whether or not i should do this but i decided that 
Lauren, the the you know my wife and the player of Silver Spectre had already told me that Sp Silver Spectre was actively pursuing and antagonizing and investigating the Silver Legion of America, and we know that the Silver Legion of America is kind of like you know uh, uh, pursuing her in return. So based on that understanding, I thought it was okay for me to ask Silver Spectre for me to initiate a detective work role and say, you know what, Silver Spectre. Give me a detective work role. I was perfectly comfortable with her failing this role. If she had failed this role, we wouldn't have known what the Silver Legion was up to. And I would have just begun play with them kind of moving, the, all the characters moving naturalistically through um, their lives and seeing what aspects of their feet they were going to kind of activate and explore. And we would have moved like that for a while. And then something would have happened sort of off screen and there, they would have become aware of something. And then they would have had to decide what, what if anything they were going to do in relation to that. And at that point, play would have been extremely unpredictable, right? I don't know what would have happened knowing them. They probably would have said, Oh no, something's happened. Let's figure it out. And then maybe then they would have tried another detective work role to try to follow the, 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 the you know, what, figure out what happened but we didn't have to go there because um when i asked her to make the role she made the role so based on her success on the role i said okay so this is what you know the silver legion of america new york chapter is in disarray it's weak has poor leadership not particularly well trained they're just kind of a hateful social club um you took care of their more dangerous elements months ago but You've picked up tips that there have been new people moving into the chapter from all over the country. And um, you get the sense that there's new leadership. You're not sure exactly who it is. Um, and you've learned that they are going to hit um, a train that is coming out of the Brooklyn Army Terminal sometime after it leaves, it departs um, this evening, and that their aim is to secure weapons that are on that train for some nefarious purpose. What do you do? So she, of course, then notified her teammates. And we've decided that because of Dr. Zapf, which is um, Major Shocker's uh, uh, sort of gadgeteer, he's the gadgeteer that makes Major Shocker's outfits, we've decided that they all have um, kind of um, Dick Tracy wrist radios, right? So she contacts the team. They meet at some as of yet, un, you know, under detailed, um, you know, conference room and some brownstone somewhere in the city and they discuss what to do. And I'm really curious at this point. I don't know if they're going to approach personnel at the Brooklyn Army Terminal and make themselves known and offer to help and and get them to armor up, you know, or to, you know, to, to beef up security. I don't know if they're going to do something in their secret identities. I don't know if they're going to try to find the Silver Legion before they can even get close to the train. I don't know what they're going to do, but they decide that they are going to basically wait for the train to leave the station, use their powers to stealth onto the train and kind of like um, sit in between cars, kind of at the center of in the middle of the train. And um, all of them are going to do that, except for just a car who's going to fly way, way up high, follow the train from, from an altitude and kind of keep an aerial, uh, you know, view. Um, uh, for himself of the, of the situation as they go. So I'm like, okay, fair enough. Um, the train does leave the terminal. You guys successfully um, get on board, no problem. Um, you're hanging out in the middle of the train. The train moves through the, the, the city slowly, and then when it leaves the city limits, it picks up speed and starts moving more quickly. I talked about how it started leaving densely populated urban areas into more kind of, um, you know, rural areas or, you know, just more isolated areas. And, and then after some time that the train was about to go through a tunnel. And I was curious to see what just car did at that point. Cause if he had kept the altitude and, and, and waited for the train to come out the other side of the tunnel, he might've seen some things, but he chose to do something else instead. And that was dive down and follow the train into the tunnel. So he was doing that. And as the train, I described as the train got out of the tunnel, it suddenly started to screech to a stop. And at that point, I told him to make a dexterity roll or smash into the back of the train. He made the dexterity roll. So he swooped up over the lip of the train um, and 
you know, and then he was looking down the length of the train and then he saw something. And in order to show you what he saw, I will take you to a map. So here we are. Here is, let's zoom in on just a car. Here is just a car at the end of the train. And if we go down the length of the train, we see his teammates hanging out in between cars in the middle of the train. And we keep going down the length of the train. We see this dude here. He was wearing black, silver, and blue motorcyclist gear. He was sitting on a motorcycle and he was waiting for the train to just come to a stop right where he was standing. And he sees Justicar and Justicar sees him. I also told Justicar that up in the locomotive, he could see that from the inside of the lo locomotive, there was this eerie white light that was illuminating the front of the, of the train that seemed to be dissipating as he came over the, the, the back of the train. And with that, we went right into combat. And so what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to do my best to give you a blow by blow of how this combat went segment by segment. See champions now has turns that are six segments long and characters act on a number of segments equivalent to their, speed so if a character has a speed of of three they'll act on three of those segments that are kind of spread out and um the segments that they act on are called their phases right so i'm going to take the segment my segment and do my best to kind of recreate what happened because i think it's really interesting in a lot of ways um and i'll, I'll give a little commentary as we go so we start with segment one which happens to be one of Silver Ranger's, Ranger's phases. It's also one of Silver Spectre's phases, but she didn't really know what was going on at this point. So her player, Lauren, decided to hold uh, Silver Spectre's action. So it was up to Silver Ranger to act. And I told Dan, you know, Silver Ranger sees you flying over the train. He gives like a warning whistle, a high pitched warning whistle, revs up the motorcycle. And starts like barreling down the side of the train heading in your direction. And I know after counting some hexes that that basically puts them about here. Now I might have to fudge some of these movements a little bit because the positioning I have here is not precisely what we had before and yada, 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 you know, so um, I'll be pretty close, but I'm going to have to fudge them a little bit as we go. But that's, that's what, what Silver Ranger did on segment one. So then we go to segment two. And in segment two, Justicar looks, Dan told me, Dan, who's Justicar's player, said, okay, Justicar does a quick glance around in response to Silver Ranger's whistle. And with I didn't make him make any perception rules. I said, okay, great. You look around, you notice right on the heels of that, on the right after that whistle was 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 issued, you see there are cars in the tucked into the trees on the side of the road. And you see their head, not cars, trucks, you see their headlights turn on and you see um, figures step out of the trucks and they look like this. They are, I'll zoom in on them in a moment. They are wearing silver shirts. They are wearing blue pants. They have masks like silver masks over the covering their faces faces and they have um you know the these kind of like uh forget what they're called but these hats um uh and they're carrying tommy guns right now except for the mask this is the attire of the real world silver legion of america members they call themselves the silver shirts um and uh, and they step out of the trucks wearing, you know, carrying Tommy guns. So with that, just a car um, calls out to his teammates like, you know, you know, uh, you know, armed thugs coming out of the cars. I'll I'll take the motorcyclists. Right. Or something like that. Something to that effect. Dan said it cooler than me. And at that point, uh, just a car moves 15. He flies 15. 
So it puts him right about here. So he's flying along the top of the train, heading in the direction of uh, Silver Ranger. Okay. Now, I wanted to pause there because in a lot of other games that I play and love, we would have been rolling attack rolls already, right? Because distances are so abstracted and they're so generous in terms of how fast, you know, superheroes can move in combat that these guys would have already been on top of each other, like rolling attack rolls and all of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly fine style of play. And it captures um, a lot, maybe a cinematic style. It captures maybe the style of a lot of animated series and whatnot. Cool. But Champions Now is trying to capture something that is beloved to me. And that's the way that comics felt from the mid 1960s to the mid 1980s, where there was this kind of soap opera of combat or this melodrama drama of combat where the way that panel work was used and the way that action was broken up by panels and the way that that thought bubbles right played in, or or speech bubbles played through these panels it created these really dramatic uh action scenes right um where a lot could be thought and said and done because there seemed to be a more measured approach to showing the action. And so here we have um, these two characters like, you know, barreling at each other, but it's going to take us a little while to get there. And, and I think that ends up being a good thing. So I wanted to point that out as something that's going to happen now. And then as we go through these segments by segments, I'll talk about some of the beats that I think that Gustakar and some of the other characters hit as this takes a little while to, to play out. So on the heels of Gustakar's speech and, and movement, um, Silver Spectre, who had been holding her action from first, acts on second also. She's actually faster than Justicar, but she was kind of reacting to Justicar's, um, you know, what Justicar said. And she'd noticed these lights come on too. So what she does is that she blows time for everybody and runs, which means that for everybody else, it looks like she's moving at super speeds. And we also say that every time that she does this for a fraction of a second, everybody sees the world as if they're looking at a, at the silver screen, right? Um, in a black and white movie, right? So that happens and she appears inside of the truck, right? I'm like, all right, well, she sees somebody in there. She's like, still has a half action left. So she uh, punches the driver and knocks him out. So uh, that was Silver Spectre's action. Spitfire, I thought was kind of cool because she also ran out. And Jen, Spitfire's player, says, okay, Spitfire's going to inhale and get ready to use her breath weapon. But then she noticed that Silver Spectre was in the mix and her breath weapon is a cone attack. So she holds back, which means that she actually lost her action this round because you can't hold half action. And I thought it was very cool because Jen... It wasn't like I said, oh, you're going to lose the half action. And she's like, oh, man, that sucks. No, she just she she did the kind of the role playing of the in, of the inhalation. And then she says, oh, wait a minute. And he called it to say, you know what? She would just give it up because she doesn't, you know, she doesn't want to hit her friend. And uh, and that's, what, you know, whatever. So that was her call. And then Major Shocker did something else that I thought was cool. He steps out of the, you know, also jumps down to the snow lands on the snow and he pulls out his, his um, lightning gun. Now Mike had told me that when we built the power, when he built the power, he made it so that this was a, a lethal attack. It does the, 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 the core damage bypasses defenses. Unless you're grounded, you have the special defense of being grounded. It bypasses defenses and goes straight to core. So it's a really lethal attack. Mike had told me, I don't really see him using this on people. I see him using this on like structures, like a brick wall, blast a hole through a brick wall or shoot a car engine to like, you know, disable the car engine, you know, the car and, and have it just not be able to move, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but he's at range here. He pulls out his lightning gun. He sees the motorcycle is coming at him, Silver Ranger coming at him. And he says, you know what? I'm going to fire a shot, but I'm going to fire like three hexes in front of him. 
I'm like, okay. So the lightning bolt hits, strikes the earth, you know, throws up snow and dirt and rock. There's like, you know, steam coming up and stuff like that. Loud, loud noise. And this was my first major mistake of the film. Because I should have called that a presence attack. And I didn't. And I don't know why I didn't. I don't know if it's because Mike didn't say, I'm going to do, I'm going to make this a presence attack. You know, and I was just still trying to kind of like, uh, you know, the first time I played champions or GM champions in, in a while with a big group. And uh, I was still trying to kind of like keep stuff in my head. So the opportunity missed the opportunity. I should have said that it was a presence attack. Now, in the end, I actually don't think it would have made that much of a difference in terms of outcome because Silver Ranger has a high presence. Major Shocker's presence is a little on the lower side. They're already in combat. Um, he would have gotten some dice for the display of power, but the circumstances weren't such that, that it would have made it a very powerful presence attack versus, you know, what uh, Silver Ranger's operating with. So it's likely that it would not have had an effect, but it might have. If I had rolled a bunch of ones and Mike had rolled a bunch of sixes, it could have made a difference. So bad on me for not calling it a presence stack. I should have called it a presence stack, but whatever. I didn't. So I just described the effects of it and said, you know, Silver Ranger doesn't seem fixed. You know, um, he tilts his motorcycle to the side and it looks like he's going to keep barreling in your direction. So he tilts it to avoid the debris, but he keeps moving in your direction. At that point, somebody else joined the fight. And that is this fellow who comes out of the um, locomotive. And this fellow, his name is Orion. And he has, he's a physical type, kind of a martial artist um, who uses a bow, a recurve bow that it's kind of like Hanks from the D&D cartoon where he pulls back and like an energy string and arrow appear and he can use these en energy arrows. So he flips out of the window of the locomotive, lands on the rooftop, gazes across the roof of the train, the top of the train, and sees just a car flying along the top of the train, but headed towards a uh, Silver Ranger. And he sizes him up, gives kind of an approving look like, yeah, and then looks excited about the possibility of tangling with him and starts running across the train to join him in combat, right? So just a car, um, and again, just a car doesn't act yet, but I described that and just a car, Dan told me that just a car, like his eyes narrow when he sees him, maybe he sizes him up a little bit too. And so he called out, Dan called out, you guys handle the motorcyclist. I'll get the, you know, the, the goon on, 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 on the crane or something like that, you know? And, you know, so Dan, Dan just described, right. That, that just a car was kind of shifting his attention, even just just a slight shift in the tilt of his wings and the way that he was going. And you see what I mean about like, because we have the action broken down into these chunks, there is time to process when things show up on the map and characters are reacting to one another. Um, and it creates something that is pretty compelling. I think even if it's just fun and lighthearted, but there's a compelling kind of emotional life that the characters can live through because things are kind of chunked and broken up in the way that they are into these kind of panels, right? So anyway, Ryan emerged and ran across the rooftop. And then it's Silver Spectre's turn again, right? Because she actually goes on three. It's one of her regular uh, segments or phases to go on. So she spends her um, action on this phase throwing the guy that she punched out the door and sliding into the driver's seat and turning the car on, revving up the engine. Right. So that's how she, sp she spends her action and silver ranger. Our evil motorcyclist moves forward 15. So one, two, three, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So he comes kind of coming straight at major shocker, right? In the motorcycle. That's his full action there. And again, I can just see the panel of like the, maybe multiple panels of the motorcycle, like far, a little closer, a little closer, and then we narrow in on um, on uh, uh, a major soccer's face, um, and we see his glove, 
you know, starting to spark. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. But that was all on everything I just said from Orion emerging until Silver Ranger moving. That was all segment three. So now we're on segment four. And um, this is what happens. Um, the First of all, I, I made another mistake here. My silver shirts, right? Well, not my silver shirts, but the silver shirts, the goons, could have gone on three. And I forgot to make them go. So I just kind of said they're holding their action and that they would go then on four. So at the top of four, the silver shirts open fire, right? Now they don't attack silver specter or she's in the, or they do, but he's in the car and the car kind of like blocks the, 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 the fire besides she has, well, let me explain how these guys work in a moment. So the way that I wrote up the silver legion, they are a hazard. They're not, they don't have a character sheet per se, they're a hazard. So they have an effect, which is bullets, right? Uh, it's a, a blast attack that is, you know, piercing and severe and blah, blah, all that stuff, right? Um, but um, the way hazards work is that on three, on third, on segment three and on segment five, they just go and their effect is felt by anybody who's in their, their range or in their, yeah, in their range. And um, the only way you can avoid the effect is if you have certain powers or skills that neutralize it, the, the hazard, or if you take the hazard out, right? So those are your two options. Now, there are a handful, like one or two hazards in the Champions Now rules that say that you can make one of the conditions for avoiding the effect a characteristic role of some sort, like dexterity rule. So I decided to use that. Basically, I said, for the silver shirts, if you have missile deflection, if you have acrobatics, or if you make a dexterity roll, you can avoid the effects. Now, I know that um, allowing the characteristic roll is not something that should happen for most hazards, and I fully understand and agree with that. But I wanted, these guys are not particularly well-trained. I wanted there to be a little bit of interactivity, a little bit of, of, oh my gosh, if I make this roll, I can avoid this bullet. And if I fail this roll, I'm going to take a bullet and to have that moment of like tension where, where the die is cast and we determine that. I just wanted that feeling. So that's what I went with. So this is what happened. The silver shirts open fire. I said that they didn't attack um, Silver Spectre because she was in the car and they weren't fully oriented to her being there. Even if they had attacked her, she has missile deflection, so she would have been able to avoid it anyway. They did attack Justicar, who was flying, but he has missile deflection too, so he just spins his, his mace of Ma'at around and bats the bullets out of the sky. Um, Major Shocker and Spitfire don't have what they need, so they have to make dex rolls. They make their dex rolls. They dive kind of opposite directions of one another. Bullets you know, fill the space in between them. Um, as uh, then Spitfire got ready to go um, on her fourth, uh, you know, uh, the segment four action. It's one of her phases. She, you know, whips up a fire bolt and throws it at one of the silver shirts and takes him out. So I'm going to remove him from play right there. So that was that. Just a car then continued to move towards Orion. So 15 more. One, two, three. 15. So right about there. Okay. All right. That seems about right. Okay. And then Major Shocker did something that was pretty cool. He, um, uh, as Silver, as I had said, as Silver Ranger barrels through you with his motorcycle, he, into, uh, towards you with his motorcycle, he reaches, he's driving with one hand, he reaches into his jacket and he pulls out an M1 pistol, an automatic pistol. And he's leveling at it to attack you. And so on four, at the very end of four, Major Shocker um, pulled up, put up his hands like, ah, you know, it's like you shouldn't be playing with toys like that or something like that. And used his electromagnetic um, gauntlet to telekinese the gun out of uh, Major of, of, uh, of Silver Ranger's hand. And so it, he was successful and he ended up with the gun in his hand. All right. So that was a really cool move. 
then it's fifth phase so uh or segment five so again the silver legion of america the silver shirts are going to be able to fire but um and, and and they do they they open fire but much the same effect people make their dex rolls so they're able to avoid the the fire um missile deflection saves just the car from even having to roll and then you know orion runs one two three four five six towards um six towards uh our friend just car all right so um then silver specter much to the surprise of everybody takes her car with bullets flying everywhere menacing her friends any one of these could could significantly hurt them he runs over two of the silver shirts right it was this very indiana jones-esque kind of moment she just runs them over okay and everybody just broke down laughing lauren was like i didn't expect her to be like this but you know what these guys are you know these guys are bad dudes she knows that and then silver Ra- um uh silver ranger goes okay so he moves three skids out right pulls out another gun from his jacket because on silver ranger's character sheet there is an attack he has that is a two gun attack so by depriving him of one of the guns he basically made it so silver ranger couldn't use that attack but he has another gun with him so he pulled out the other gun skidded sideways and just shot major shocker in the chest hit major shocker doesn't have any resistant defenses he doesn't have a force field nothing he can abort to take the damage from it hits blood stunned reels back falls on the floor and it's a shocking moment right um and that happened at the end of segment five okay with that orion um at this point uh takes a shot at if i'm not mistaken let me see yeah so we're on on segment six and Orion at this point takes a shot at um at Justicar. He feels he's he's like close enough and he's gonna take a shot at Justicar. And Justicar makes a missile deflection roll and bats the attack away. At that point, point Silver Spectre can act again and she backs the truck up and runs over the last of the silver shirts on this side of the map. So she backs the truck up and takes out that silver shirt. Okay. Now at this point, you know, spit, spit, spitfires go. And she just heard the roar of the motorcycle coming up behind her. She heard the gunshot. She turns, she, she sees major shocker reeling back with a wound to the chest. And Jen described how her hand just burst into flame. And she started to rise into the, into the air. So she's flying now. He turns towards Silver Ranger and she throws a bolt of fire at him. Silver Ranger holds up his uh, his jacket sleeve and blocks it. He didn't block it. He took damage from it. But it's just describing how he kind of shielded his face as the the fire like like you know erupted around him. He took damage. He winced at that point, and then just a car. Yeah, just a car dives at Silver Ranger, right. At this point, and this is like because of what Silver Ranger just did, his focus on Orion is broken and he turns, he gets angry at seeing his friend drop. He turns his body, tightens his wings and dives at Silver Ranger. And what he's trying to do is to grab Silver Ranger's motorcycle, right? He rolls. I gave him a bonus because the motorcycle is big, but he rolled poorly. He missed it by one, right? And it was now, um, uh, yeah, it was now Silver Rangers go, right? So it just happened that Silver Ranger went right after just the car. So we just picked up the action on the heels. Just the car missed because Silver Ranger, you know, like revved up his motorcycle and tore out, right? So he moved a half move away. Okay. And as he did, he um you know reached to his belt pulled out a grenade and threw it behind him 
And so the grenade goes flying through the air. It's going to land right in the midst of all the heroes over here. And we just, you know, I described like the, you know, Spitfire who, um, you know, uh, sees it, uh, well, all of them, but it was just coming like closer to Spitfire. And she was the one that was most like, cognizant. So I described how it was moving like slow motion, uh, you know, towards her. She sees it going and then Silver Spectre aborted her next phase action to use her, her missile deflection, which she has usable on others. And she made her roll and she froze the grenade in place now normally you cannot um use missile deflection to uh to stop an area attack but it says in the book depending on the special effects and based on the special effects for silver specters attack it makes sense that she'd be able to do that so you know um spitfire sees the grenade coming and then she sees it suddenly go black and white like in a black and white movie and she knows at that point that silver specter just saved her butt and probably you know, um, uh, uh, major shockers, but too, because he's lying there like almost unconscious and the grenade would have gone off near both of them. So that was, I thought was a really cool move. And at this point, silver, you know, major shocker spending his round recovering from his stun. Right. So that was one turn of combat, right. Um, segments one through six. Now we're going to jump back up to the top and let me see, this is where I start to get a little fuzzy on what the actual, positioning of movements were so forgive me for that if i kind of mess up here but um uh at this point what happens we have orion takes another shot at just a car just a car bats it away again with his missile deflection okay um silver ranger moves away silver ranger um moves one two three four five six over here to regroup with his men Oops, why didn't he move? Oh, there he goes. There he goes. He moved over here to regroup with his men, and he's kind of shooting as he goes, but he misses. Okay. Spitfire moves closer. She flies um, and throws a bolt that hits him as he's kind of like pulling up next to the thing. He gets hit in the back by the bolt, but it doesn't stun him or take him out. He's taking a little damage now two bolts but he's still he's still all right and um just the car moved um just the car this is okay hold on did i miss something here Yeah, I think actually when I said that Orion that Orion shot at Dustacar, I think actually, if I remember correctly, he held his action. Because we have Dustacar started to move in this direction, and Orion like flipped over and landed in his path. Right? Like like I remember that. There was something going on at that moment. I think that's what it was that he was trying to get a good beat on Justicar. He knew Justicar was kind of like um, batting away his attack, so he didn't want to waste another shot with his bow. So he held his action. That's what it was. And when Justicar started to fly after Silver Ranger, Orion flipped over, landed in front of Justicar, and presented himself as a target using his recurve bow, kind of at that point, like a almost like a staff, but he went to kind of like a martial position in front of Justicar. Right. And so he moved in and he, he attacked just a car. Um, and then they started trading blows there. Right. So this is happening on, um, on, uh, yes, yes, that happens on segment two. That's ha that happens on segment two and a major shocker at that point, um, gets up. Right. He gets up and he's um, he's kind of back in the fight for a moment. So um, on segment three, Orion tries to attack major uh, tries to attack uh, just a car again and he misses. And then this is a really interesting moment because um, Silver Spectre. So this is segment three. Silver Spectre runs over to the grenade that it's suspended in the air. And Lauren tells me that <laughs> that Silver Spectre is going to grab the grenade. And she's going to pull it out of its stasis 
who's going to throw it at um, at Silver Ranger. Okay. And, you know, it's questionable as to whether or not she could do that. Um, and, and it's not always going to work out this way, but based on the special effects and based on the situation where we were in, I'm like, yeah, okay, you can do that, but roll to hit. And so she rolls to hit and she rolls miserably. She rolls horribly. And we rolled randomly to see in which direction the grenade was going to go off, you know, and how far away from the target. And she ended up throwing the grenade right at the feet of Orion and Justicar. The grenade explodes. Justicar goes flying against the, tr the train, embeds himself. He gets embedded. He doesn't embed himself. He gets embedded in the train, slams into the train. He doesn't get stunned or anything like that. He slams into the train. And Orion, the knockback on this grenade blast is insane. Orion goes hurtling through the air. Head over heels, lands on top of this truck over here where all of the silver shirts are, like on the hood of the car, like smashes down. He's not stunned, but he is damaged. And he gets up saying, white flame, we're losing. We got to get out of here. Okay. So um, Silver Ranger at this point, I think, is taking shots at Justicar. Justicar is just knocking the shots um, out of the air. Um, and at this point, the, the silver shirts open fire because they go on three, two. So um, they, yeah, so they, they open fire. Same thing as before. Just a car is able to bat all the shots aside. And then he, Dan tells me that just a car says run to them just the way he put it. Right. So I'm like, all right, this time I picked up on it. I said, let's make that a presence attack. He rolled, he rolled really well. The silver shirts rolled really poorly. So the silver shirts end up like, fleeing at the end of this attack. But unfortunately, that happened at the end of this attack. They didn't just attack just the car. They were attacking everybody. And um Spitfire was able to uh make her um her aerial defense, right? So she was able to um she made her dexterity roll. So she was able to kind of like fly um out of the out of the trajectory of the of the of the bullets. Um uh Silver Spectre was able to freeze the bullets in time. Again, she has missile deflection, so they just don't affect her. But poor Major Shocker failed his dex roll. A bullet grazed his skull, and he went out. So Major Shocker had a really rough combat, and Mike played it so well. He didn't complain at all about it, and he spun the, the loss into what I thought was really interesting stuff in the second session, right? So we'll have to see how that goes second session, but it was really well played on his part, you know, so really grateful for that. So um, we get to segment four and I describe how um, at the top of the segment, we see a tongue of flame appear in the air, like just behind Orion and under that tongue of flame appears a woman, an ethereal woman that's floating in the air. And she's kind of coming down, gliding down to the top of the truck. And she sees just a car and her eyes widen. And she says, what? This isn't possible. Something is wrong. And she's really like disturbed by just car's presence. And, um, and uh, Orion was like, my flame snap out of it. We got to get out of here. You know? Um, and at this point, the, they, the heroes realize that the, these guys are going to get away if they don't do something. So, um, uh, um, let me see, where are we? So Spitfire ends up flying. Um, she pushes her flight, if I remember correctly, she pushed her flight so she can get close enough because she detected that these guys were about to try to make some, some getaway. And she, you know, finally did her, her, air, her, her fire breath and she just engulfed all of them in flame. And they're all screaming except for the woman whose ethereal flames are licking through her and she doesn't seem to take any appreciable damage. But there's this flame everywhere engulfing them and they're, they're taking damage from it. And then just a car comes flying over as the flame dies down he flies over so from silver ranger's point of view there's just flame and when the flame ends 
He sees Justicard wings flying over him, a mace raised over, and he just whack hit Silver Ranger, rolled really well to hit, did a lot of damage. And I'm like, you knocked Silver Ranger's teeth out of his mouth, some teeth anyway. He flies back, he slams into the truck. He is unconscious. Um at that point, um uh um Orion shoots like he's death's brick. He's just shoots a shot at just the car, just the car bats it out of the way. Silver Spectre went over to see if um <laughs> if Major Shocker was dead, right? So she went over to try to help Major Shocker. Um and then Orion tried to attack again. This now we're on segment six. Orion tries to um uh oh no, yeah. Orion yeah, Orion attacks again. Um this time uh yeah, again trying to 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 take out, you know, shoots another arrow at Jetticar, doesn't work. Um uh Spitfire um was getting ready to attack. Um, but before any of that can happen, White Flame, who I've now covered up here. Hold on a second, guys. Let's move on the side. White Flame uh engulfed herself and the two villains orion and silver ranger in this white flame orion screamed in pain when the white flame kind of took him over and the white flame seemed to consume all three of them and they disappeared so that was the end of combat but there's a little bit more that i have to relate here because with that spitfire flew over to see how major shocker was doing and just a car angry over what had happened and everything grabbed one of the fleeing silver shirts and flew him up into the air, flew him up, 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 up into the air. And then he used his like see truth power, which is when the goddess Ma'at kind of like manifests and allows him to probe. He can't send thoughts, but he can read thoughts. And so he started reading this guy's truth and he learned a lot of just information from the guy. He learned that, yes, the Silver Ranger was the new leader who had been kind of organizing the Silver Shirts and the Silver Legion to be more muscular about their activities, that there had been a big influx of people. These are things that Silver Silver um, Spectre already knew. There have been people, new recruits coming in from all over the country who help in this, that um, they had a farm up in upstate New York that they were using to train, that um, um, he wasn't too sure about who white flame was. She's always just shown up as white flame. Um, and this silver shirt was like, I don't know why silver ranger tolerates that dame. He obviously doesn't really respect her, but we, I think he, she bank rolls some of what's going on. So that's probably why he keeps her around. Um, who's, who knows if that's true or if that's just what this guy's interpretation of things was. Um, and about Orion, he said, never saw Orion before. He just showed up right before this caper, um, kind of on White Flame's arm, right? So she brought him to this to this um, attempted heist. But he doesn't know anything about Orion um, beyond that. And then, forget how it happened, but Jeff the Car then wanted to know more about the guy that he had. And I'm like, all right, he is a dentist. He's just a professional. It's just a regular folk a person. He has a, uh, you know, he has a, a practice. He's a dentist with a practice. And I said, you know, he has just these hateful ideologies. And I said, you know, he he actually uh, works them out on his patients, right? Whenever he gets a patient that he deems somehow not fit, you know, um, racially or or in terms of their religion or ethnicity or anything like that, that he will delight in not providing enough anesthetic and causing pain and, you know, really kind of like making them suffer right before he lets them go and doing a poor job on their teeth and et cetera and all of that. And, uh, I don't know, just something about the way that everything had built up and these final details and just the Cardan just said, you know what, Ma, he basically tells the guy the the goddess has found you unworthy. And then just released him. And so the other two were trying to help Major Shocker, seeing like, are you all right? You know, can you, can you relax? You know, and then they hear a scream. They look over. They see the guy falling to his death. 
and they see just a car just winging his way down towards them and he lands next to them and um i think it was spitfire that looked at him with like kind of wide eyes and said like i am sure you'll i'm sure you'll provide us an explanation and then they they heard the the arrival of like you know they saw you know that that the activity has attracted attention they saw lights of what they thought might have been like a local sheriff or something like that pulling up and he was like it will have to wait and and then they all flew off so he flew off and then um silver specter and um uh and and spitfire helped major shocker get out of the scene and and were planning on escorting him back to brooklyn and that's where we broke for the day that was our first session of champions now and um it was just so much fun. Let me say that, you know, I, I really appreciated playing a superhero role playing game where there was no hero die or hero point mechanic. There were so many moments, just a car grabbing the, the, um, trying to grab the motorcycle or, um, you know, uh, uh major shocker um getting hit twice and being nearly killed um these were moments that had really strong kind of consequences and emotional heft and uh, dramatic heft and and if we had hero point mechanics probably all of those would have just been erased hero die mechanics all of those would have maybe been erased and it felt really good to play a superhero game again where we just let the literally let the dice fall where they may and, and let them determine things. And um, I don't know. I thought, I thought it was just great, just great fun. So um, all right. So as I suggested, there were a lot of unresolved um, issues in this, a lot of questions that were generated. I'm like, okay, well, what are, what are, you know, how are the other team members going to react to what just a card did? How is just a card going to react or Dylan going to react to what just a card did? What are the consequences going forward of what they did? How is the silver Legion going to react? Um, what, you know, what is major shocker going to do now that he's basically been taken out, right. By thugs with bullets, right. You know, um, how is he going to respond to that? Um, what you know, there's just a lot i was really curious to see how they were going to process this in a session two and i will show you how they did that um, next week um all right i think i'm going to cut it there um uh i i will say one more thing you know my friend dan, i mentioned in the last video that my friend dan had a um a, a liver transplant like two weeks ago he's doing much better he is he was sent home um and uh and uh he's excited to get back to the gaming table soon so you know it's going to be a long recovery but i think gaming will be part of that recovery right it's it'll it'll be great to have him um back at the table and uh you know again he's moving in the right direction so all is good there um and and yeah so as usual i'm going to say i wish you good health i wish you good cheer i wish you good gaming Goodbye.